further reason why Christianity has been so successful. And that's precisely that um, it does embody the idea of progress. The idea that the world, that things can get better, that your understanding of, 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 of what is right and proper can improve is another legacy of Christianity. To get Brexit done. Make America great again. No, no, no. Hello, this is Stephen Edgington from The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Tom Holland. Tom Holland is a historian and writer. He has also authored the book Dominion, which is about how Christianity made the civilization we live in today. We're going to be talking all about his book. Thanks so much, Tom Holland, for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. What makes Christianity special? Goodness, that's a, a sweeping <laughs> and huge question. Um, essentially, I, I think that um, what makes Christianity um, very, very distinctive, in fact, I would say uh, probably the most influential and um, revolutionary way of, of understanding the cosmos and humanity's place within it um, that, that, that has ever existed, um, is its incredible ability to um, transform and uh, shape the way that millions and perhaps now billions think. And I think the measure of that is that uh, you don't even need to be Christian to be profoundly, profoundly shaped by it. Um, so much so that I would argue that, that those of us in the West um, who, who may imagine that um, because we no longer believe in God, because we no longer go to church, are, are therefore no longer Christian, are deluding ourselves. In fact, we are, you know, if you think of... Um, of the West as 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 a kind of goldfish bowl, we are the Christianity is the uh, is the water that we as goldfish are swimming in. We may not even realise it, but it's just part of the essence of what we live in. And what are those traits, those themes throughout history, that you can say are uniquely Christian and which have helped form our civilization? Well, the thing is that that to understand that you've got to kind of really pull the camera back a very long way, and you've got to look at the world that existed before Christianity came into it. Now, Christianity, nothing comes from nothing. Christianity is a fusion of all kinds of different influences. So Jewish, very obviously, um, the kind of Greek philosophy, um, the way the Persians saw the world as divided into rival spheres of good and evil, and um, the Roman Empire, which was the, 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 the context that Christianity grows up in, which had this idea that the whole world could be joined and united into a single order. And Christianity takes elements of all of those and fuses them together. But the, the fusion does, I think, create something incredibly new. And I think that, that there, there are really that perhaps two things that, that have, have been particularly influential and continue to be influential to this day. One of those is embodied in the primal symbol of Christianity, which of course is the cross. And to the Romans, the cross was an emblem of power. It was an emblem of their right and ability to torture to death anyone who opposed them. So particularly slaves, it was the, 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 the death that was given to slaves and particularly to rebels. So the, the idea that, um, that a man could become a god was, was nothing unusual to the Romans. Uh, Julius Caesar had become a god, Augustus Caesar had become a god. But what was totally odd, totally bizarre to the Roman way of thinking was the idea that someone who had suffered the death of a slave might in some way be god. And what that served to do was to enshrine in the heart of all those who became Christian and the civilization that it gave birth to, the notion that perhaps the slave is closer to God than the master, that perhaps the person who is tortured to death has a greater dignity than the person who is torturing him to death. And what that does in turn is to kind of place a depth charge under the assumption of the very rich, the very powerful, that their authority is, if you like, God-given. That what it does, Christianity, is in a way to kind of privilege those who lack privilege. And that's something that is still very much a part of, of, of Western society generally, even if it may not recognize it as being Christian. The other thing I think that Christianity does is it takes elements from Greek philosophy and it takes elements from, from Jewish scripture and it fuses them to create a notion 
that all of humanity is is one that for christians um men and women are created in the image of god um and therefore have an incredible and an inherent dignity but what christianity does is to say that um as saint paul puts it that there is no dual greek so there are there are no differences between peoples from different parts of the world there is no man or woman so there should be a kind of fundamental equality between men and women there is no slave or free so there is no there should be no uh, differences between those who come on different places in the class system uh, in christ now it that in christ so that's the kind of get out for christians um because to begin with this is such a radical idea that that, that you know Christians in the Roman Empire can't consider a world where men and women are equal, where, where Romans and barbarians are equal, where, where there is no slavery. But again, these are kind of like depth charges that slowly ripple out and the impact of them over the course of the centuries and then the millennia is felt more and more and more. So I think that um, the idea that, say, racism is an inherent evil, the idea that there should be equality between men and women, the idea that slavery is wrong, these are notions that to us seem self-evident, but they were not self-evident at all to the world that Christianity is born into. And it takes such a long time for these ideas to kind of percolate through that it's really not until you know the 18th or 19th century that these ideas really start to get currency. So. Those two ideas, I would say, are, are, are the kind of the, the, the two most revolutionary concepts. And they're the ideas that, um, as I say, they, they, they are constantly evolving. They're constantly rippling out from the kind of the, 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 the formational moment of Christianity. And we still live with the implications and the after effects of those ideas now. As I say, even if you're not Christian, you are going to feel the force of those ideas. They are very much the kind of the basis for public morality in the West today. It's an interesting book and, and the topic is interesting because I think to some historians and to some um, modern academics, your topic would be controversial. Uh, Christianity in many you know, uh, faculties is seen as unpopular and sort of um, it's gone out of fashion a bit and I think that most, you know, most academics these days are probably um, atheists and um, there's also a popular view of, you know, in recent years that Christianity is irrelevant, um, that it's kind of an oddity that other people do and it hasn't really had much impact on our history and that you know in actual fact um, the enlightenment and people like Charles Darwin and um, new ideas from a few hundred years ago were they were the the basis um, and they were the sort of you know what you call death charges as to the reasons why we progress so much in the last few hundred years so what do you say to this kind of postmodern view of the world that in fact the enlightenment was the most important era um, and everything else before it was sort of the dark ages and a bit irrelevant well as i say if you're a goldfish it's uh, very hard to recognize that you're in water um i think that um there is a sense in which um atheism in a sense is a kind of logical end point of a tradition within christianity because if you um if you think about a figure like Richard Dawkins, for instance, he's, he's often described as an evangelical atheist. And evangelical comes from Greek. It means that you are spreading good news. You have good news to teach. That's very much how Richard Dawkins sees himself. He, he, he believes that um, the people are, are walking in darkness and they have to be brought into light, that superstition has to be banished, that the idol of religion has to be overthrown. And that when people do that, they will be enlightened, that um, they will be open, that the scales will fall from their eyes. Now, why does he feel the need to do this? Where is this, the, the impulse to do this coming from? It's not an obvious impulse. You only think it is because we take for granted that this is what people should do. Why do we think that? Well, I think that you can trace it a very, very long way back. I would argue before even Christianity back to the Hebrew prophets. Isaiah says the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. That's where the idea of, of 
enlightenment banishing darkness comes from. The Hebrew prophets are looking at the, the idols of Egypt or Babylon and saying, you know, these are nothing. These are stock and stone. Overthrow them except the one true God. And that's something that Christian missionaries in the early Middle Ages, when they're going into the, the dripping woods of northern Germany and chopping down trees that are sacred to Thor, that's exactly what they're doing. And it's exactly what in the Reformation, Protestant reformers like Luther or Calvin are doing when they look at the, um, the icons in Catholic churches. Again, they're saying we have to banish this because it's superstition, because it's idolatry. If we do this, then the spirit will descend on us and it will illumine our hearts and it will enlighten us and we, the truth will be given to us. And essentially, that is all the enlightenment is doing. The enlightenment is exactly replaying these ideas. But it's instead of doing as the Protestants did and looking at the Catholic Church as the idolatry that has to be banished, it's looking at the whole of Christianity. But the impulse remains a deeply, deeply Christian one. And essentially, if you um, assume that, uh, that, that superstition is something to be banished and that by banishing superstition, then you will gain enlightenment, there inevitably comes a point when, when you are going to start thinking, well, let's just get rid of God completely. So you move, you move from you know, the pre-Christian world where gods are manifest in springs and streams and trees. And then um, under the influence of Christianity, God gets banished from the earth around us and gets some kind of up there in the sky. And then with kind of modern atheism, God goes completely. But I would argue that the impulse makes no sense at all without Christianity, that, that in a sense, when people say you know, atheists are evangelical. That's exactly what they are. They are evangelicals. So are we in a dying phase of Christianity in the 21st century? Well, uh, globally, no, not at all. Uh, globally, Christianity is, is absolutely booming. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the growth of Christianity in Africa, particularly over the past half century, has been astonishing. I mean, nothing really like it since, um, since uh, Europe in the early Middle Ages. Um, and uh, the, the, the growth of Pentecostalism in particular, this idea that um, the Spirit does descend on you. So Pentecost is when the, the Holy Spirit descended on the disciples and they began speaking in tongues and feeling that the fire of the Spirit was, was illumining them. This is something that, again, is spreading across the world. Um, and because it tends to happen in, in, in large churches that people um, who, who write newspapers or, or, um, or, or make or television programs tend not to be aware of it doesn't tend to have the focus that say islamic radicalism does but really it's it, along with with radical islam it's the great convulsive religious phenomenon of the age so that's going on i do think that um that in europe and increasingly in america of course um the the, the christian tide is receding um as I've said, I, I don't think that that really makes society any less Christian. I think that, that we're so saturated in it that it's very hard to get, you know, very hard to get rid of it. It's a bit like, um, I was kind of thinking when I watched that, you know, there was that wonderful drama series about Chernobyl. Um, and I'm not comparing uh, Christianity to, uh, not saying that Christianity makes your hair fall out <laughs> or makes you sick, but the way in which the, 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 the radioactivity spread across Europe from Chernobyl you can't actually see it, but it's changing you. You're breathing it in. It's affecting you. It's a bit like that, 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 that you can't just get rid of its impact, it, its influence. It's there within you. It's part of your mind. It's part of your emotions. It's part of what makes you you if you live in the West. However, having said that, I do think that one huge change is that, and, and I noticed this, um, the difference between the schooling that I had and the, the, the schooling that my children get is that um, I took I, I was completely steeped in all the kind of Bible stories. So the story of um, Exodus, the story of Moses leading the children of Israel from Egypt and, 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 and slavery to a promised land, or the parables that Jesus tells. Um, and I think that that a huge part of the influence of Christianity over the two thousand years of its existence hasn't lain in the kind of moral commandments that it gives, or, or even necessarily in the habit of going to church, but it's laying in these stories, those stories of the Good Samaritan, things like that, that these have been absolutely fundamental and I think remain fundamental. So I think that, that, that a huge part of why people in, in Western countries um, 
debate whether to um, allow in refugees, um, people coming from foreign lands. Most countries through most of history would never allow that. Um, people coming into your land, you know, kill them, throw them out, build large walls to keep them out. The idea that you should let people who are of, of a completely different uh, land, maybe a different faith, come into your country and care for them, that is a kind of legacy of the parable of the Good Samaritan, the story that um, Jesus tells where the Samaritan, who is, who is someone who is looked on um, with disfavor by Jews, finds a Jew who's been beaten up and left on a road, picks him up, puts him into a hotel, pays for his medical care, cares for him. And that idea is kind of so fundamental to the way that people assume that we don't may, maybe not even realize it where, where it's coming from. But I think that, that if, if you're starting to have um, generations that are growing up that are not familiar with that story, not familiar with the Exodus story, then perhaps over the course of the generations, looking you know, a century or two ahead, then it's very possible, I think, that, that, the, that the whole of Christianity will start to fade. And the teachings that um, those stories convey their impact will fade as well. Let's separate, just for this question, let's separate the sort of values of Christianity that um, form our mind and the way we think. And, and you know, you've given some great examples there about asylum seekers and things like that. And then the, the belief itself in God, um, and also sort of, as you said, going to church or praying and you know, doing the things in your daily life that would actively consciously be Christian or wanting to follow a sort of moral set of guidelines. On that latter point, do you think there is a small resurgence um, in the Western world where people feel, through the decline of religion, people feel that they have no purpose in life, people feel that they um, are empty and there's nothing guiding them, and um, you know, depression has gone up, unfortunately, in, in recent years, especially among young people, suicide rates, things like that. Um, and then people are now returning to church and, and looking to the church uh, specifically for um, some kind of guidance and some kind of purpose in their life. Do you see that happening? I think that um, undoubtedly the the effect of uh, COVID has been to focus people's minds on the big questions <laughs> in a way that perhaps um, they haven't been um, in 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 kind of happier and more prosperous times. Um, now, whether that feeds into um, uh, a desire to go back to church to explore those the, the, the questions that Christianity historically has has sought to answer. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, my, my sense is that um, actually that although churches have um, been very active as as they always are, say in Britain, um, in caring for those who are you know, ill. Uh, who are poor, those who, who, who are on the breadline. Um, and, and that's part of the work that the churches have always done. Um, whether, they, whether they have been um, active in you know, trying to explain why, is, why, why are we going through this? What's it all about? Why, why would a good God allow this to happen? I'm less sure about that. Um, I mean, I, the, the, one, the one, thing, one thing that really cut through to me personally was something that happened quite early on in the pandemic, when the Pope um, did a, a mass in St. Peter's Square. And because of social distancing, he was the only one <laughs> at the mass. So he was alone in, in the vast space of, of St. Peter's Square in, in front of the, uh, the Basilica. And in the background, you had sirens wailing as ambulances were, were taking people to hospital. And you had bells clanging out over the city. And he went to, um, to pray before an icon of the Virgin and the infant Christ, which had been sent to Rome um, 1600 years before, sorry, 1500 years before, um, from Constantinople. And it had been sent to the Bishop of Rome, so the Pope, who was a, a Roman aristocrat called Gregory, who had become Pope at a time of plague and people were falling in the streets of Rome. And Gregory had led this procession, uh, begging God to, to, to lift the plague. And he had prayed before this icon and the plague had stopped. 
Now, Gregory himself was a, a great writer, a great thinker, and he had written um, a huge commentary on the book of Job, which is a book in the Bible, which describes how um, a good man called Job um, gets handed over by God to Satan and Satan inflicts all, all kinds of unspeakable horrors on him, including a, a plague of boils. And Job sits out in the rubbish, in the ashes, scratching at his boils. And people come and ask him, well, why has this happened? And the whole book is about why do awful things happen? And Gregory in, in, in Plague Ravaged Rome had written about that. So I got this incredibly eerie sense that here was a kind of link going back centuries and millennia, that, that the Pope was joined to this earlier Pope who was joined to the book of Job. And the sense that um, Christianity is in, I mean, it has this, you know, the, the, these, these chains leading us back over time of people who have gone through what we have gone th are going through now, people who have suffered as we are suffering and their experience, their answers, it does seem to me is an incredible resource for us if we want to look back to it. Because I agree, there is a kind of, um, there's a kind of uh, slightly attenuated, a slightly um, impoverished quality to the answers that we're trying to find compared to the kind of sense of the richness you get, the, 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 the sheer antiquity and, the, and the, the, the range of answers that that Christian heritage provides. But whether the churches have been active in, in kind of saying, well, look what we've got, come and try it, I don't know. But, and, and it may be that I'm kind of more open to that because I've been writing about it and thinking about it so much. But I, I have to say that personally, I've, I, I, I did find that sense of communion with people who'd suffered what we're going through all those years ago, incredibly moving and, and kind of a, a, a source of comfort, I guess, over the past months. And I think, you know, for a lot of people, the rise of social media has isolated them, you know, even before the pandemic. Um, and I think a lot of young people are growing up in a very different world to their parents with this, you know, interconnected um, internet that has, as I say, isolated people, it has caused them immense pressure, I think, on their mental health things like Instagram and, and, and stuff like that. I just see, I, this is just anecdotally, I see a lot of people that I know, young people, um, going to church uh, when they never ha have before as a kind of place uh, of worship, as a place of, um, I don't know, comfort for well, them. I suppose I, I suppose churches are one of the places where you can't, you can't check Instagram, or if you do, you're going to get quite. So if you if you do want a place where you can just get away from it and um, not be constantly checking your phone, I guess that that is certainly something the church does offer. I mean, that's interesting. I I um I have to say that I haven't noticed it from my own children at all, but that's kind of interesting. I suppose not surprising because I think that um, you know, uh, these very very ancient traditions um you know all the all the all the kind of the great so not just christianity but islam or judaism or the hindu traditions the buddhist traditions they 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 have stood the test of time because they they do provide sources of comfort and explanation in 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 difficult in difficult times um so i'm not surprised and 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 the one that we have particularly in this country is this great kind of a heritage of, of of christian tradition and perhaps to, to to go into um you know a church in england or or, or or you if you're going to say a parish church in, in in a village or churches in um in say in london um it may be that you're going into a church where people experience plague you know if you're going to a church in london you might go in and and and, and people had had prayed in the in the church that you're going into during the, the great plague of, of 1665 or perhaps even in some of the older churches the black death and i think that um maybe it's not overly romantic to say that um you know there's something in the walls <laughs> the, the sense of people who prayed there going through these terrible experiences you know, it's, it is like a kind of radiation, a lingering kind of radiation that hangs in the air, that hangs in the walls. But it's not one that kills you. It's one that provides comfort and reassurance, I think. Something that I find extraordinary about Christianity and all religions, I suppose, is just how long they've lasted throughout the years and how those ideas have, um, you know, perpetuated through thousands of 
years, different generations, different peoples, all thinking differently from various different places in the world, different climates, yet these ideas have remained. Is, it, is Christianity fundamentally a human idea, something that, as you say, explains away our curiosity about the world, it explains why we're here, explains the problems around us. Is that why it's lasted so long? What are the reasons that it's lasted um, so long? Well, I think, I mean, I think that initially, why, do, why, why does it spread as fast as it spreads? Well, I, th I think that, that because it's drawing on all these various elements in the Roman Empire, you know, there are points of, of, of familiarity for people, but it, 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 it also offers all kinds of things that, that most people in the Roman Empire had not experienced. Namely, the idea that uh, you can have a personal relationship with a loving God who is going to care for you, and that that loving God is going to inspire people around you to look out for you. So if you are, um, you know, at the bottom of the heap in a Roman city, by and large, there isn't anyone who is going to look after you if you're sick or, or care for you if you're old or look after you if you're an orphan. It's, but, but that's what Christians provide. And over, over the course of the first centuries that Christianity exists, um, essentially what, what, what the church comes to embody is a kind of welfare state. It's the first welfare state. And it's like a kind of cuckoo in the nest of the Roman Empire. Um, so you can obviously see the appeal of that to, to those who are very, you know, at the bottom of the heap. Equally, um, in the fourth century, a Roman emperor, Constantine, decides that he's going to become a Christian. And the reason that he does that is because Christianity appeals to his vanity. Constantine doesn't want to be the servant of loads of gods. He wants to be a servant of one god, because then that makes him seem all the more impressive. So there's also something for the very powerful. So you can see why um, over the course of the centuries, the fact that Christianity can appeal both to emperors and to kings and to popes and to the very powerful, while simultaneously appealing to those who are at the bottom of the heap, means that there is essentially something there for everyone. Now, I think that, that, that there is a further reason why Christianity has been so successful, and that's precisely that um, it does embody the idea of progress. The idea that the world, that things can get better, that your understanding of, 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 of what is right and proper can improve is another legacy of Christianity. Because I, I, essentially what, the, the, the idea that, that say, St. Paul, who, who's the first person who, whose writings, first Christian whose writings we have, he was, he, he, he was a Jew, so he's raised in the idea that God has given a framework of laws to Moses that are essentially good for all time, and you follow them, and that, 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 that is the way to, um, to please God. Um, Paul changes that, and he says, actually, the law of God now, now that, that, that Jesus has come and gone, now the law of God is written on the heart. And if you look into your heart and the spirit of God illumines that, then you can read what God wants. And the implication of that is that um, over the course of time, people will come to have a better understanding of what it is that God wants. So that hardwires in the idea that, you know, the laws that people write, the standards that people uphold can be progressive, that it can get better and better over time. And again, I think that that is an idea that you, you no longer need to be Christian to have. The idea that, that laws should be progressive, all kinds of politi politicians say, I'm, I'm a progressive politician. That doesn't mean that they're Christian, but what it does mean is that they're absolutely saturated in the assumptions that, uh, that Christianity has propagated. And I think that um, that that again is, is, is a kind of crucial part of Christianity's success, is that it offers people the, you know, the idea that Christianity is inherently conservative, that it's backward looking, that it's kind of stick in the mud, couldn't be more wrong. Christianity is, is, is turbulently revolutionary. It's constantly changing. It's constantly demanding of people that they change, that they question themselves, that they ask, can things be better? Can things improve? And, and you know, that, that, that is, that is the world in which we live, and we live in it because it is essentially Christian. I'm going to put to you a more cynical view of Christianity, and I want you to respond. Um, there is this view that Christianity is basically a means to control the masses. It's a means to, uh, for kings and emperors and rulers 
to subdue their people, to make sure they don't rebel or riot. Um, and then there have been you know, some absolute corrupt versions of Christianity which has, which has um, terrorized people in Europe. You know, I'm thinking of the Spanish Inquisition and um, you know, various aspects of the Catholic Church throughout the Middle Ages. Um, was obviously very draconian and, and, and in our, you know, looking back now with, with our modern eyes, um, very corrupt and, and obviously bad. So how do you view this idea that Christianity is just a means to control the masses? Well, on, on the Spanish Inquisition, and, and I suppose you can include the Crusades as well as that, as the, the examples that are always held up of, of why Christianity is bad, uh, by what standards are we judging them? What are the standards by which we say these are bad? Well, crusades, you shouldn't go around attacking people. You shouldn't make wars. You shouldn't fight wars. Why do we think wars are bad? Romans didn't think wars were bad. Greeks didn't think wars were bad. Vikings didn't think wars were bad. The Mongols didn't. Um, why do we think that? Because we have um, at, at, at our heart uh, of, of our civilization has been a God who came down, was made mad, was made flesh, um, and when he was being dragged off to crucifixion, told his disciples, put up your sword. He went willingly to death. The idea that uh, fighting war is, is something you shouldn't do is kind of hardwired into the Christian mind. Um, even though, of course, <laughs> there are kind of, you know, the reason the Crusaders are able to fight is that they could also draw on all kinds of scriptural inheritance that said, yeah, it's fine to go and, and fight and kill. But there is that the, the, the primal figure of Jesus who did not draw a sword, who went willingly to death, is the reason why, by and large, in our society, pacifism is such a strain. Um, likewise, with, with the Spanish Inquisition, what is the issue with um, uh, officials of a, a very, very powerful state putting to death someone unfairly for what he claims to be? Again, lurking behind that is the shadow of of Jesus being nailed to the cross and I would say that um, you know the, the the instinctive revulsion against that has been manifest in the Black Lives Matter protests because um, you know who is George Floyd what, why why did it have such an impact he's someone who is killed um, unfairly by um, by the by, by the officials of a very very powerful state and you know his last cry is I can't breathe and that's how you die on the cross. You can't breathe. So the, the, the impact of these is very, 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 very strong. You know, it's so strong that we may not even realise it. Now, the, the, your, your broader point that um, Christianity is a kind of drug. Well, I guess Marx said the opium of the masses, that it kind of numbs and, and deadens them. Um, yeah, that, that's absolutely a part of the package. I mean, that is why Constantine goes for it. Um, you know, it does help. It does help him to rule the empire, and there's absolutely no question that um, that, that that Christianity has kind of you know it, it, it's become um, a part of the establishment, um, and that's often why people react against it. But again, why do people see that as a problem? Because actually, what Christianity is simultaneously doing is always saying, "Question the powerful." Um, so. If you look at Marx, for instance, who says that, you know, religion is the opium of the masses, get rid of it. Um, he says, we've got no time for this kind of nonsense. All you need to do is to look at the numbers. So he sits in the British Library number crunching and saying, this is what the figures show. This is what we should do. Um, the, 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 the time will come where the, the oppressed will overthrow the oppressors. Um, and the time will come when um, uh, a new order will uh, prevail on earth and all shall be just and um, the kind of assumption that um, it is right and proper that the first shall be last and the last shall be first and he says that this is all manifest in in the numbers that he's looking at and so therefore there's no need for religion but that's simply not true that's not what his figures show the reason that he thinks that the reason that he's so passionately committed to it is because he is the heir of Jewish and Christian traditions that are, are, are saying that, you know, Christ's words, the first will be last, the last will be first. That is what is animating him. And that's exactly the role that Christianity has played again and again and again. Because I would say that a, a society that has Christianity at its heart, as, as Western, as the West has had, you know, for, for, for centuries and centuries, is basically 
um, it's like Sa San Francisco built on the San Andreas fault that you can you can build your skyscrapers and your bridges and your coffee shops and your um, you know software empires but every so often the tectonic plates are going to grind there's going to be an earthquake everything's going to come tottering down and then you're going to have to rebuild it and that essentially is what has happened over the course of Christianity because you're absolutely right that you have these kind of great revolutionary convulsions the, the Reformation would be an obvious example where um, the settled order is seen to be corrupt uh, and it's got to be destroyed we've got to bring it down we've got to cleanse ourselves we've got to purify ourselves we've got to make everything you know good again but then what happens the the revolutionaries of one age become the elites of the next and that in turn kind of breeds a, a further dissatisfaction so um, by the end of the 18th century you've got people who are looking in France who are looking at the king who are looking at the bishops and saying unacceptable you know they they are oppressing the, uh, the, the 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 poor the poor starving masses we must overthrow them but again they're doing that for deeply deeply Christian reasons the French Revolution is as much an expression of this kind of Christian impulse that society must be baptized and, 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 and cleansed and the first should be made last and the last should be made first as anything within Christian history. Uh, it's interesting with the French Revolution, I'm currently reading a fantastic book on Napoleon uh, by Andrew Roberts and how quickly uh, people are willing to accept the very ideas that they were rebelling against just 10, 20 years ago yeah, in France was uh, extraordinary. <laughs> well, and you see, the Christian response to that would be to say, well, we live in a fallen world. Uh, you know, we, 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 ca we cannot become perfect. It's impossible because the whole world is, 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 is sinful. The only, the only way that we can we, we, we can um, we can liberate ourselves from that is in heaven. And that's kind of, again, something that Marx hated. I mean, that's why he said it's just like, you know, it's like heroin. You might, you know, you're just putting it off to death. Why, what, what's going to happen in, the, in, in this world? But the idea that, you know, Christianity is, despite the fact that it says that we are sinful and so therefore we can never ultimately build Jerusalem on, on, on earth. You know things will always go wrong nevertheless it does say we should try we should try and um the way in which um attempts to to reform the world always seem to lead to kind of napoleon's emerging in a sense it's not disproving christian teaching it's kind of upholding it well this idea of utopia is fascinating and to, you're right it's not a christian idea let's look at some of the murderous regimes in the last couple of hundred years nazism communism obviously both of those regimes were looking for some kind of utopia how does christianity fit into those narratives of history in, in, sorry into those ideologies how does christianity um play you know were they christian ideas and i know communism is a really obvious one where you can say that was completely yeah going against I, I think communism is is a kind of very uh, distorted Communism would not exist without Christianity. It, 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 it's idea, you know, it, it preaches a brotherhood of man and it preaches the idea that, um, that, that, that those who are, you know, the proletariat, the oppressed masses have, have a dignity and a value that the, the oppressors, the wealthy and the rich don't have. And that's, that, that kind of assumption is inconceivable without the kind of the, the seedbed that, that Christianity had provided. I mean, obviously it, it's, it's an ideology that has no place for Christianity um, and, and persecuted it savagely. But then, of course, you know, there have been Christian, you know, Protestants persecuted Catholics, uh, Catholics persecuted Protestants. You know, the, the conviction that you, you, you have been given the truth and you've obtained the truth is, again, part of that Christian inheritance. Uh, it's always a kind of a danger inherent within it. So I think that you, you, you can recognise that um, communism, even as it was overtly very anti-Christian would never have existed without Christianity. Now you also mentioned Nazism. Now Nazism of course does have, um, is, is drawing on elements of, of Christian ideas. So why is it a, a, a thousand year Reich? Because the, the idea of a thousand, a thousand year reign of the saints is, is in the book of Revelation. So that idea that you're going to have an apocalypse 
uh, where you build a new order. That's very much kind of part of the Nazi inheritance. However, having said that, I think that the, the na Nazism, unlike communism, is a dramatic repudiation of Christianity because it's not just repudiating the church. It's not just repudiating a belief in God, but it's repudiating you know, the primal beliefs, the primal values of Christianity. So those two values that I talked about, the idea that um, those who are oppressed have a particular value and the idea that we are all created equally in the image of God and therefore we all have an inherent human dignity. Those are ideas that communism upholds. They are ideas that Nazism radically and brutally rejects. Hitler obviously thinks that, that, that strength is the essence. And in doing that, he's consciously looking back to the world that existed before Jesus. He's looking back to Greece. He's looking back to Rome. He's looking back to the idea that the Greeks had that to be strong, to be beautiful, is the essence of what it is to be good. That those who are weak, those who are ugly, are a lesser order and should be trampled down. And that's the ideology that, that Nazism upholds. Of course, Hitler also radically repudiates the, the teaching of St. Paul that there is no Jew or Greek. Hitler absolutely thinks that the differences between Jew and Greek, and, and Hitler thought that the ancient Greeks were German, is completely, completely radical. I mean, it's completely fundamental. And so that is what provides him with the license to commit genocide. Um, essentially, he, 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 he radically repudiates the idea that, um, that, that every human being has an inherent dignity, that every human being has rights, if you like. And the idea of rights, again, is a completely Christian one. It's, 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 it's something that, um, that, that lawyers in the 12th century start formulating. So all these ideas are um, trampled down by the Nazis. And I think that when, when, um, when, when Hitler is defeated and Europe and, and America kind of look at what's happened and then the understanding of the, the full horror of the Holocaust starts to dawn, what happens is that um, the horror is so great that in a sense, people who are living in Europe or America no longer need Christianity for their values. Because whereas before the Nazis, people would say, what would Jesus do? And then try and do it. Since the war, people are inclined to say, what would Hitler do? And then do the opposite. So in a sense, we no longer need the devil because we've got Hitler. We no longer need hell because we've got Auschwitz. And there is a, se there is a sense then in which we remain Christian because we have in our minds what the world without Christian values looks like. I don't think most people think of it in those terms, but that in effect is what is happening. Why do we think the Nazis were evil? The Nazis didn't think they were evil. The Nazis thought that what they were doing was, was the correct thing to do, the right thing to do, the proper thing to do. Um, we think that they're evil because the Nazis offended against our most fundamental values. Our values are fundamentally Christian, and so that basically is, is, is why we regard the Nazis as evil. Let's talk about Nazi Germany and then I want to also mention Charles Darwin who's a fascinating figure in the story of recent yeah. Christianity. Um, Germany, was it a deeply Christian nation before the Nazis came to power and how did Christianity or people who were Christian at the time react to the Nazis? How did they interact with the Nazis in Germany, outside of Germany? Um, what, was the, what was the reaction of people in, in Germany? Because I think a lot of people think of the Nazis as, as this kind of alien race. They're not human, um, human beings. They're this evil, satanic people. Whereas in actual fact, of course, they were human beings. And Germany was, of course, one of the most educated uh, nations on Earth. And in a matter of a decade or so, they turned into one of the most horrific human experiments ever created. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think actually Darwin is a part of this story, so we could maybe be, begin by looking at Darwin, because um, having said that almost every um, kind of change development is, is saturated with Christian assumptions, I do think that um, Darwin is, is someone radically different, because um, the implications of, of, uh, of Darwinism is that um, 
the weak it's it's for the good you know the, the way that it comes to be interpreted is that it's for the good of a species that the weak do not survive and although the phrase survival of the fittest is not darwin's it it is coined by his cousin almost immediately and that is how it comes to be understood in britain um, and in germany and it's welcomed by um by all kinds of people in, uh, in, in late Victorian society. It's welcomed by industrialists and it's welcomed by um, enthusiasts for empires um, because what it does is actually to say that the strong should inherit the earth. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how it comes to be understood. And this has a kind of, you know, this, this, this saturates through and you start to get kind of euthanasia movements. Um, um, eugenics movements, uh, the idea that um, it's important for populations to winnow out those who um, are going to drag it down. And it has a kind of deadening effect and it combines with the, 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 the feeling that Darwinism also encourages that the Bible is uh, basically got it completely wrong, that, um, uh, that it's not to be trusted, that therefore there is no God. Um, and you start to get the sense that actually the 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 kind of the, the way that you should understand the world is that um, it's a world in which there is no God, and um, the the duty of people is to um, is to the good of the race that they belong to. So the idea of races is also kind of part of this, which again is a highly unChristian idea because the Christian idea, you know, there's no dual Greek, there's no black or white, say, but. The, but but what also becomes increasingly popular in the wake of Darwinism is the idea that um, there are kind of different races of humans and that they have um, different kind of evolutionary standing. And inevitably, because it's white um, Europeans who are, who are formulating this idea, they tend to say, well, it's whites who stand at the top of the hierarchy. So all of this is a kind of toxic swirl that depends on um, essentially the kind of the, the, the decline in, 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 um, in Christian uh, teachings and assumptions. And in Germany, it, um, it combines with the effect of, of defeat in the First World War to animate um, essentially the fascists. Uh, who, who then in turn are influenced by Mussolini. And Mussolini is a kind of fascinating figure because um, he is simultaneously backward looking and forward looking. He's backward looking in that he models himself on the Roman emperor, emperors. Um, he's looking as Hitler does as well to the pre-Christian world, to the values of, of, of classical Rome and Greece where the strong are idolized and the beautiful are idolized. Mussolini is also looking forward to a kind of a future full of technology, uh, cutting edge science, uh, progress is seen in entirely material terms. So it's that fusion of the kind of ancient and modern that Hitler then inherits and bundles up with this kind of idea of races um, and uh, that the strong have to trample down the weak. And, you know, it, 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 it's very successful. Um, it seemed to be kind of the cutting edge. It's, it seemed to, to be where the future is. Um, and I think that the, 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 there are lots of Christians in Germany who 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 feel the power of this because they they even if they continue going to church they feel that well you know could, uh, this is all a bit boring a bit dull particularly in the Lutheran churches where um, you know you don't have both both um, Hitler and Goering were, were, were Catholic and so were very kind of keen on the spectacle that um, that the Catholic churches offer but I think Lutherans when they looked at all the swagger and the glamour of a Nazi parade kind of felt well this is a, you know this is a bit more fun than uh, than going to church and essentially what happens over the course of of the Third Reich is that um, the the church the Lutheran church is kind of seduced and in Dominion, the book I've written about this, I, I, I look at it through the prism of Tolkien, who is writing The Lord of the Rings at the same time. And if you think of, um, of what um, Sauron does to the nine uh, kings to whom he gives the rings, they get transformed into wraiths who then become his servants. I think there's a sense that that's what the Nazis are doing to the, the church. They're trying to turn it into wraiths. Um, so, and in doing that, they are drawing on perhaps what is the darkest inheritance of Christianity, which is this deep, deep strain of hostility to the Jews. 
and um, they turn it into essentially um, you, you end up getting Lutherans who um, repudiate the whole of the Old Testament as a kind of farrago of Jewish nonsense. Um, they, 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 they turn their backs on the entire Jewish inheritance. Um, and that gives you a glimpse of perhaps of what the Christian church would have become had the Nazis won the war. It would have, it would have been a, a very, very unfamiliar kind of creature. Um, against that, there are, of course, lots of Christians who are appalled by it and who are, you know, suffer martyrdom for it. Um, the, uh, the, the, there is a bishop, a Catholic bishop, who um, is one of the few people in the Third Reich to oppose the, um, the Nazi project of eugenics and live to tell the tale. Um, and there's no question that, again, had the Nazis won the war, the Catholic Church would have been destroyed because um, it was intolerable to the Nazis that anything could have an existence outside the state. That's what totalitarianism means. So um, Nazism was, was a terrible test for Christians in Germany. Lots passed it, lots didn't. And, you know, you're right to mention that priest. I've forgotten his name, but he, he made a speech um, openly criticising this euthanasia programme. And in response, Hitler thought um, that public opinion, opinion was so against the euthanasia yeah. programme, he had to shut it down, which was absolutely fascinating and, and brilliant story. Um, you know, with so much evil that there's, there is a bit of light there. Let's bring the conversation to 2020, to today. Um, there's a lot of ideas going around at the moment to do with postmodernism, what people call the woke movement, and identity politics. And in many people's eyes, this is the idea that, in fact, the most important thing about each other is not what Martin Luther King Jr. said, um, the content of your character, but it is, in fact, the colour of your skin. Um, this is the idea of white privilege and, um, you know, basically the Black Lives Matter movement and, and people putting, putting up uh, and um, the idea of sort of femini modern feminism, I'm thinking about gender equality. Everyone talks about the innate characteristics of human beings. Do you think this is fundamentally not a Christian idea, the idea that the most important thing about us um, is whether, whether we're a white male or whether we're a black woman or whatever? Well, what I, what I think is fundamentally Christian is the idea that um, those who are, are oppressed should cry out for justice. And I think that that is what underlay both the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter movement. And what is striking about both of them is how readily they were accepted by men in the case of Me Too and white people in the case of Black Lives Matter, which in turn suggests how radically Christian um, the, the, uh, the kind of the DNA of our society remains. And I think you mentioned Martin Luther King. I think you can see that the civil rights movement provided the model for all kinds of, uh, of, 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 of very different movements of which feminism and gay rights would, would both be examples. Martin Luther King is consciously, you know, I mean, there's a clue in the name. <laughs> Martin Luther. Um, he's, he's a Baptist minister. Um, he is able to draw on that great scriptural inheritance. So he is constantly talking about Exodus, the idea of slaves being liberated and coming to a promised land. But he is also reaching out to white Christians and saying, you know, we are all brothers and sisters. Um, there is no black or white. There is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. There is no man or woman. Now, all of this is, is, um, absolutely in line with traditional Christian teaching. And that's why the civil rights movement works, because white Americans basically accept the justice of, of, of what Martin Luther King is saying. What, what also happens though, is that gay people, uh, feminists pick up on this and, and the, the, the model of activism that Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement have provided becomes a model for them. And the implications of that are harder to square with Christianity as it's traditionally been understood. And so you get the sense in America, but also here, that um, over the 60s, 70s, 80s, that society is splitting in two, that you have Christians and you have progressives. Uh, and that's 
as is always the way when you have a kind of conflict, um, the no man's land widens and widens and the trenches get deeper and deeper. But I think that, you know, as I've been saying, this idea that, you know, the, the you know, wh why should women be given equality with men? Why should um, uh, gay people who've been uh, oppressed and persecuted, why should they have, um, you know, wh wh why should they be given tolerance? The, the answer to that, again, lies in this kind of Christian assumption that those who are oppressed should be offered comfort, that those who are last should become first. So you can, I, it seems to me that the, the culture wars in America, which, you know, and the echoes here, that it's not, as it's traditionally said to be, a war between traditional Christian values and a kind of progressive rejection of Christian values. It's a civil war within Christianity. It's, it's, it's what aspects of, of, of the Christian inheritance do you choose to emphasize? So I, th I think that, that the culture wars remain, you know, they, these are entirely to be understood in Christian terms. Now, having said that, I do think that, 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 that you're right to seize on, on the salience of, of identity politics within this, because of course you're right that the, the, the key Christian teaching that Martin Luther King is drawing on is precisely the fact that there is no man or woman, that there is no, no Greek or Jew, there is no, no black or white. Um, and, and that is a difference. Um, and I think that the emphasis on, on identity, even though the, um, it, it, the, the, the sense that those who have, I mean, essentially your lack of privilege becomes a source of privilege. Um, so you will see that, that people are desperate to, you know, even if they, 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 they don't have, um, you know, even if they don't come from an oppressed background, they will do their best to manufacture one. And the more oppressed you are, in a sense, the more, the more kind of uh, status you come to have. Which, which is a kind of paradox that only makes sense in the Christian context. But I think that, 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 that a kind of odd corollary of that is, has absolutely been to, be, to dissolve this kind of idea that we are all one, that we are all equally created in the image of God. And it does seem to me um, that to, to, to emphasize that, um, you know, if, if you're opposed to, to racism or sexism or whatever is a bit like sitting on a branch and sawing it off. Well, it's, it's an interesting idea, you know, th this idea that you can meet someone and you will know everything about them just by the fact that, for example, they're a straight white man um, or, you know, that they're a disabled gay woman, that somehow these things um, are something to, to judge someone on rather than, you know, as I say, the content of the character. I just want to finish um, by asking one more question about history that's really relevant this year, and that is the tearing down of statues. What do you make of this idea that we need to tear down um, people that we can now think as, um, sl you know, slave owners and horrible people, things like that? Should we be tearing down those statues um, which represent something that we're not quite happy with today? Well, it probably won't surprise you to hear that again, I think that this is kind of expressive of very, very ancient Christian impulses because tearing down statues, toppling idols is something that, you know, I mentioned before that reaches back a very, very long way. And periodically over the course of, of Christian history um, and particularly Protestant history, this kind of impulse to, um, to uh, kind of whitewash um, idols, uh, whitewash perhaps not the correct word, but um, to, to, to tear down um, statues has, be, has been a recurrent phenomenon. And I think that that's therefore, you know, it, it, in a sense, this is nothing new. Um, do, do I personally think it's right or wrong? Well, I, I, my, my, my personal take on this would be that um, if, if a statue is put up to celebrate something that a majority in society no longer regard as acceptable, then I don't have a problem with taking it down. Um, and if a statue is put up at, that celebrates someone who did something that we have come to think is wrong at a time when most people, when that statue went up, thought was wrong, then also I don't have a problem with it. So the Colston statue, um, that, had that been put up when Colston, you know, after, immediately after his death, by people who had benefited from his charity, so paupers, orphans, whatever, had they had people had a subscription and raised money to put that statue up, then I think it should have stayed because who are we to 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 say that um, the gratitude of the people who put it up is wrong? Who are we to sit in judgment on them? Um, however, that's not when the statue was put up. The statue was put up at the 19th century 
at the end of the 19th century, at a time when um, people in Britain were becoming increasingly anxious about the future of the empire. So it was a kind of way of, 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 of affirming uh, the, the might of the empire. And it was put up by people who knew that Colston had made his money in slave trading and that slavery was wrong. So I didn't have a problem with it coming down, to be honest. However, if we look at someone like uh, Nelson, Nelson is celebrated because he saved his country. And I think that that's absolutely, <laughs> I have no problem with celebrating people who saved their country. I have no problem with statues of Drake or Nelson or Churchill. Now, uh, Drake certainly was a slaver, but by the standards of his age, he saw himself as a moral man. He was viewed by the standards of his age as a moral man. He saved his country. So I, I, I don't think that we should um, sit in judgment on him from our perspective of, of 2020. Um, Nelson, I think, you know, he was not a slave owner. Um, and it was, there is controversy even about whether this one letter in which he, 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 he opposed, he, he said that he was opposed to will before, he was opposed to abolitionism. It now seems possible that it was, that this was doctored by anti-abolitionists. Um, Nelson's um, heroism coexisted, you know, he was, the, the reason that he's regarded, oddly is regarded as a hero is precisely that he was a very flawed person. You know, he, he famously, <laughs> cuckolded his mistress, his husband. Um, he was a very flamboyant man. That's kind of why he died. He got, you know, he was wearing all his medals on the death of victory. Um, and I think that the, the fact that he's a complex, very human character is a part of what makes him heroic, oddly enough. So, um, I, and I think that, um, that to push for, um, you know, to cancel Nelson would, would be deeply counterproductive because it would, it would infuriate so many people that they then might start to turn against the cause that um, people who would want to uh, to cancel Nelson would be would be promoting. I think that so so that essentially would be the framework that I personally would apply. Um, but it's obviously something for that that that, that we as a society are going to have to negotiate. I think there's a great quote on this. I've forgotten who said it, but um, you know they say Churchill was a racist, but so was your grandparents. Um, so you're going to well, and also, you know, if you think Churchill was a racist, you know, the guy he fought in the Second World War was pretty bad too. <laughs> so uh, to hear about it. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Tom Holland, for joining us. That was great. Thanks ever so much for having me.